thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak in this conference. So um, today I'm going to tell you about um, uh, various works of mine related to um, trying to understand how to, um, how to apply uh, string theory, so top-down models uh, of ads and cft for condensed matter um, problems and um, also how to um, better understand and to use particle vortex dualities in this context. So the works uh, that I'm going to be talk about are uh, written here with Asadik Mohamed, Jeff Murugan, um, Christian Lopez Arcos, um, Nitin Rugonas, and John Schock. So as a, by way of introduction, I will tell you how we think about um, ADS-CMT methods and uh, specifically the um, two plus one dimensional model that um, I will be concentrating on the ABJM model. Then I'm going to tell you that we, could, we can reduce, we can find a, a billion reduction to um, a condensed matter model, and specifically the relativistic Landau-Ginsburg one, as well as a non-relativistic one, uh, which I will call supersymmetric Jacquiv P model that has uh, Schrodinger symmetry. <coughs> then uh, I'm going to try to describe um, particle vortex duality uh, in a path integral and how to use that um, and how to understand that in the duality between ABJM and the DS4 cross CP3. Then uh, I'm going to tell you that, in fact, particle vortex duality can be uh, generalized to a non-abelian case. And, uh, and the last part will be a condensed matter application of a particle vortex duality, uh, which will be a duality between uh, various manifestations of topological superconductor and topological insulator. All right, so <clears throat> first of all, what is, um, how do I understand usually ADS-CMT? Most of the models that people in introduce, as you've seen partly at this uh, meeting, is that they are phenomenological. However, in the sense that one uh, builds up some gravity dual that has the right properties for some um, condensed matter problem of interest. But um, my interest is, in fact, to use some exact duality from string theory, something that we know works, and see um, if we can, um, um, we can use it for uh, some specific um, condensed matter purpose. So, uh, just to, uh, to review a little bit, the usual ADS-CFT, meaning the top-down approach, is that you're, uh, you have some low energy theory on world volume of some brains, are the, either D brains or uh, M brains in uh, M theory. And this is dual to some gravity theory in the background um, curved by the brains in some decoupling limit. The decoupling limit usually involves going to the, with a the string coupling to zero as well as alpha prime to zero, going into a near horizon limit usually, something like r to zero, and a large number n going to infinity, which on one side is number of brains, on the other side is a rank of some gauge group, while keeping that Hoft coupling fixed and large. And then generically the gravity dual, in this construction, generically the gravity dual of some conformal field theory in D dimensions is an ADS space, maybe asym uh, asymptotically ADS, cross some compact space. And then the conformal symmetry of ADS, uh, the conformal symmetry of uh, the conformal field theory corresponds to the isometry group of uh, ADS in D plus one dimensions. And the global symmetry of the CFT corresponds to some isometry of the compact space. Um, and then people from this people assumed holography being more general. Uh, that is to say some d-dimensional conformal field theory corresponds to some uh, gravity theory in ADS uh, d plus one. Where... Um, 
some fields in ADS space correspond to sources on the conformal field theory at the boundary. And in order to build up some, um, some, uh, um, gra some um, gravity dual for a specific uh, conformal field theory, you have to impose perhaps the symmetries of the problem. But with this kind of phenomenological approach, uh, you have perhaps two uh, important problems. One is how to justify when the model uh, really applies. I mean, since you don't have a derivation, you can uh, only look for uh, whether it gives uh, correct results as for any phenomenological model. But also, uh, condensed matter models are generically abelian, whereas for gravity duals, you need um, a large rank for... Um, the duality to be well defined. And so, from that point of view, I thought that perhaps it's better to use some exact duality that we know works and find when and perhaps when and how we could use it. Then I will concentrate in two plus one dimensions where the primer, or if you want hydrogen atom, the simplest thing you can think of, uh, is this model called ABJM model, which has six supersymmetries. It's conformal with a gauge group, um, sorry, SUN cross SUN, not SUN. Um, and uh, it's of the Chen Simons type. So let me describe a little bit in a little bit more detail what uh, this ABJM model is. ABJM, by the way, stands for these people who uh, wrote it in 2008. Um, so it's a model that is obtained on the world volume of n M2 brains in uh, M-theory, M-theory being the strong coupling limit of string theory that lives in seven dimensions. So n, brain, n M2 brains moving on the space um, C4 mod Zk times a flat 2, times one, 2 comma 1 dimensional space in the IR limit, that is to say, when you consider large distances. And it was proved to be dual to uh, string theory in uh, this background, ADS4 cross S7 mod ZK. Um, and then if one fixes the Toft coupling, which in this case is N over K, um, that means one has to take K to infinity together with N infinity. And uh, then S7 mod ZK becomes CP3, in the K going to infinity limit. So the gravity dual is string theory on ADS4 cross CP3. And so since we have this CP3 uh, compact space, we have to dimensionally reduce on it. And we'll get some fields in ADS4 dual to some operators in ABJM. And then in condensed matter, moreover, we generally want finite temperature, so we have to put some black hole in this uh, ADS4. Here I wrote the, um, I mean, schematically, the ABJM action. So there's a Chen Simons, uh, Chen Simons term for um, an SUN group, then a Chen Simons term with opposite level, with minus K, for another SUN group. Then there's a kinetic term for some bifundamental scalars, and kinetic term for bifundamental spinners and a sixth order potential for the scalars and some um, terms for fermions interacting with the scalars. Um, we also have um, a BPS solution, that is a solution that preserves one half of the six supersymmetries. Um, so for this solution, the scalars are proportional to some constant matrices divided by square root of one of the coordinates. <coughs> so actually the scalars are split into C alpha and C alpha dot, so half of them are zero, and the other, uh, the other ones are this way. And uh, moreover, the ABJM model admits a um, mass deformation that, strangely enough, preserves all the n equals 6 supersymmetry. So that's kind of unusual. 
Um, I mean, n equals 6 is not maximal. In, uh, in three dimensions, n equal 8 would be maximal. But nevertheless, this is kind of impressive because um, the uh, mass deformation breaks the global symmetry SU4 that normally you associate with um, n equals 6 supersymmetry. So breaks it to n equals 1. Um, but uh, but symmetry transforms are still uh, invariant under SU4, which is why you have uh, 6 supersymmetries still. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, supersymmetric deformation uh, adds some terms to the potential and gives some masses to the fermions. And when you introduce the deformation, instead of a BPS solution, you find uh, a n equals 6, so fully supersymmetric ground state um, called a fuzzy sphere. And uh, specifically, is a fuzzy two-sphere, although for a while people thought that this was a um, three-sphere, but we've proven in this paper that it's actually um, a fuzzy two-sphere. So the solution now is just some constant times this constant matrices G alpha. And the matrices G alpha satisfy um, this equation, which I want to think of it as sort of an algebra, like a generalization of... Uh, it's like a spinner representation of um, um, the algebra that normally writes for SU2, uh, Ji, JJ is epsilon i, jk, jk. So, um, and as we know, that, that algebra describes the, what one normally thinks of the fuzzy two sphere, but uh, it turns out that this algebra describes that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, we've, we've uh, shown several checks, but um, yeah, I mean, one simple way to think about it is that you can have, uh, for, you can construct from this an algebra uh, that is uh, isomorphic to the S2 algebra, and reversely, that, that's a little bit more complicated. You can uh, go from the usual representation of the S2 algebra to this representation, and, um, but perhaps, a more intuitive way is because, so when you say something is a fuzzy sphere, you mean that it satisfies some condition that, uh, that is like the uh, condition for a sphere. And so this, for the normal representation, of, for the normal uh, SU2 algebra, this is correct, this being JJ plus one, right, this is, uh, this is, uh, I mean, within a given representation of SU2, the sum of uh, J squared is a constant, right? That is one reason why you can think of this as a, f um, as a fuzzy two-sphere. And you can, uh, you can write down something similar in this case. You can write down a condition like this. Now here alpha is one and two, and uh, G alpha is complex. So this in principle would be, so whereas here this would be one, two, three. This alpha is one, two, but being complex, this would look like it's a condition for a fuzzy three sphere, why, which is why people were initially confused. But um, even at this simple level, you can find out that uh, uh, one of these Gs, for instance, is real. So effectively, this is uh, um, a, two, a two sphere. So this is just some simple physical uh, interpretation, but um, um, you can be much more precise. Anyway, so uh, we can consider um, an ansatz for an abelian reduction of the ABJM model. And the ansatz is written in terms of these matrices G alpha. And so <coughs> uh, the scalars are now Q alpha and R alpha. And here there's no sum, so um, we consider the scalars are proportional to the corresponding uh, uh, matrices. <coughs> the matrices G alpha are um, bifundamental, so they are in the N representation of one of the SUNs and N bar of the other SUN. <coughs> so in order to 
write an answer for the gauge group, I have to write something that is in the adjoint, which is G, G dagger. This is the adjoint of the first group, and G dagger G is the adjoint of the second group. So, um, well, I mean, I want to argue that we're still, uh, it's, yeah, so the, the question is, I do not know uh, what, is, uh, what is really the uh, gravity dual right now of, the, uh, of this abelian reduction. But I claim that at least for some solutions, this is, uh, there are at least some solutions um, uh, in the gravity dual correspond to some solutions in the abelian reduction. Um, more than that, I cannot uh, really say, but what I want to point out is that these matrices not, are not diagonal so matrices. They are uh, matrices that have um, some of diagonal components as well. So I think of this as, yes, it, it, is, it is a reduction, but it is a non-trivial reduction that, um, that involves components uh, of an SUN group. <coughs> um, let me say a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> so, if we further make a, cons uh, of a consistent uh, truncation with phi 1, phi 2 equals 0, and chi 1 is a constant, then um, the action for uh, one of the gauge fields become auxiliary. It's written in terms of, um, I mean, its equation of motion is this, uh, this relation. And substituting back, one obtains uh, the action uh, an action of the uh, landau giersberg type with a kinetic term for uh, this gauge field with a complex scalar and the potential that uh, is written in here. So the potential has some uh, quartic piece, some quadratic piece giving the mass that can be either positive or negative depending on these parameters and then some cost constant piece. <coughs> so this is, um, this is an action of the relativistic landau ginzburg type, meaning it's, uh, it's the Higgs type if uh, uh, this term is smaller than this term, and then it's, uh, and otherwise it's a massive uh, five fourth. So <coughs> from that point of view, I can, uh, I can rewrite this as some G minus GC in the way that, I, that we write for landau ginzburg so we write some coupling minus some uh, critical coupling or mass minus critical mass if you want um, in front of the quadratic piece <coughs> and uh, moreover the uh, truncation that uh, I described for you is consistent um, uh, at the quantum level that is to say can find a scaling that decouples the massive modes, so even in loops, uh, we, do not, uh, we do not see them. So in other words, that um, this, um, uh, this relativistic landau ginzburg is really a low energy effective uh, theory for some modes, in the same way as one thinks in a condensed matter system that uh, the landau ginzburg is really an effective low energy theory for some complicated um, Hamiltonian. Um, so, as I was saying, we want to think um, uh, we want to think of the abelian reduction as the collective motion of uh, a, a large number of fields. So, there are n out of the order n squared elements being turned on. Um, so, because of this, we I mean, we hope that, in fact, the gravity dual will be, um, would be some sort of uh, well-defined uh, uh, subset of the full uh, gravity dual of ABJM, but we haven't been able to find that. So, the way I think about um, the reduction, of the abelian reduction of ABJM, is similar to the way... Um, one finds uh, the uh, relativistic landau gisberg uh, model starting from some more fundamental model like 
the uh, Hubbard model of uh, spinless bosons. So in condensed matter, people think about, um, about some uh, fundamental uh, model, like this Hubbard model where um, you have some kinetic term for some spinless bosons, and then some uh, probability to hop from, um, to, to change the spin of the, uh, sorry, to, to hop from one side to the other. Um, and, um, and then um, through a certain reduction where you construct um, a field, something that looks like a relativistic field out of combination of, um, of a uh, creation operator on top of a ground state, and um, so, sorry, an annihilation operator on top of a, uh, of a ground state, and then a creation operator for holes or antiparticles on top of the same uh, kind of ground state. So you create in this way a, um, a scalar field and you calculate the um, effective uh, Lagrangian for this scalar field and it looks like a relativistic Landau-Ginzburg one. And the point is that in this way, if the coupling here is smaller than some critical coupling, you get a billion Higgs, which within the context of condensed matter means a superconductor. And if G is greater than GC, you get uh, an insulator. Moreover, that means, since G is some coupling, that means that at G equal to GC, you get a conformal field theory. Um, and as we heard the, um, last week uh, from, uh, from uh, Carlos's lectures, for instance, if you turn on a temperature, then that corresponds to a quantum critical phase uh, that opens up around GC. It's a quantum phase because uh, this happens, I mean, the tran phase transition happens at zero temperature, happens due to quantum fluctuations. Um, and it's a, critical, it, it's a critical phase since um, this uh, has no, non-zero uh, non width when you introduce temperature. And the interesting thing for ADS-CFT is that this phase is at uh, a large value of the coupling. It's strongly coupled, so it's hard to describe. So it's uh, very much um, something that we want to uh, describe with ADS-CFT. So, um, so the hope is to, uh, to understand uh, this kind of behavior, so the quantum critical phase described by the relativistic Landau-Ginzburg uh, theory <coughs> by using um, ABGM. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal, I think of this project, yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I would need to remember. It's some combination of the couplings in here, but uh, I can't remember. Yeah, the derivation is in, uh, in the book um, by Sachdev on quantum critical phases, but uh, I forget right now the relation. No, the idea is the one that I, I wrote in here, right? So, so you, you create, I mean, the point is you have to create, you, you consider the ground state, which is the ground state of this Hamiltonian is with an equal number of bosons. And then you consider the same way as, as you, as you know, Dirac thought about uh, quantum fields, you consider uh, adding a particle or adding a hole, an antiparticle, right? And then you write the quantum field as usual. It's a coefficient times A plus another coefficient times the other field uh, complex conjugate, right? So, and then, then you start to calculate what, what would be the Lagrangian for this, given that you know the Hamiltonian, so you know what happens when you modify things around the ground state. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so uh, I've showed you how to get to the relativistic Landau-Ginzburg model. 
But in fact, um, perhaps it's also useful, I mean, perhaps even more useful to think about systems with non-relativistic uh, symmetries since we are, after all, in condensed matter. And um, so when one can reduce this uh, massive uh, n equal to supersymmetric uh, Land version of the Landau-Ginzburg model. So here, I shown just the um, bosonic action. There was a bosonic reduction, but I can generalize this to a supersymmetric one. <coughs> so um, the resulting um, action I've written it here for uh, for completeness. So <coughs> besides these uh, bosons that I've already described, there are now also some fermions uh, denoted by um, uh, eta and eta tilde, eta i and eta tilde i. And uh, we have some Bose-Fermi interactions as well, um, besides the potential that was already written. Um, <coughs> and once you do that, you can take a non-relativistic limit on this field theory. The prescription is um, rather well known. You have to reintroduce um, um, Cs and masses uh, in, in this Lagrangian, the way it was written was written in with C equal one. <coughs> and then you have to uh, rescale the fields. So you write, the f for instance, a scalar field in here is written as the non-relativistic field times E minus MC squared of H bar T. So this is the, the non-relativistic part of the, so, sorry, the, the rest mass part of the um, um, expo normal exponential e to die kx. Uh, so, so normally you write phi times this uh, negative exponential plus phi uh, hat uh, complex conjugate e to the positive exponential, this being um, the antiparticle part. But in the non-relativistic limit, the particle and antiparticle part of the field evolve independently, they're separately conserved, so one can focus on simply the particle part, so effectively the non-relativistic limit amounts to writing instead of the relativistic field, this combination with h bar was square root 2m, the non-relativistic field times this exponential. And uh, for the um, fermions, you can do a similar thing. You can, fermions are two components, so you have to, um, to, to write them um, in terms of, um, um, of uh, one component fields. Um, but uh, yeah, so and half of the components are, are dependent on, on the first half in the uh, non-relativistic limit. Um, so all in all, you, the non-relativistic limit of this Lagrangian is described by uh, this mapping. <coughs> and uh, then in order to get an, a supersymmetric action, we find for consistency that we also have to rescale in a certain way the um, supersymmetry parameters. Uh, epsilon was uh, a fermion with two components, epsilon one, epsilon two, and um, these two components are required to scale uh, differently with C. And then uh, the corresponding uh, non-relativistic action that we get is written in here. So there's a Chen Simons term which is not modified in the non-relativistic limit. Chen Simons term keeps the same form. Then there's a, a non-relativistic uh, scalar action, non-relativistic fermion action and some um, potential. So there's a uh, quartic scalar interaction and the interaction of two scalars with two fermions. <coughs> and as we see, this action is a supersymmetric form of the so-called Jakiv P model that, um, that uh, was uh, quite used in condensed matter. The Jakiv P model uh, is uh, the one written in here with, um, well, I called it psi in here, but um, I mean, it's a, yeah, I should have changed the notation. This is a scalar. So there's the Chen Simons term, there's a, 
a kinetic term for the scalar and um, a, uh, oh no, sorry, no, in this case, wait, uh, yeah, it is, no, it's supposed to be a scalar. Sorry, yeah, I, I don't know why I wrote psi. Here we have a phi four uh, interaction. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the interesting thing about this Jack FP model is that it has um, BPS vortices that are non-relativistic vortices. Um, and its equation of motion is of the type of um, uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, right? So um, if you write the equation of motion, you get a single derivative and derivative is proportional to, uh, so yeah, this has the normal uh, Delta psi term, and then here you get a non uh, you get a nonlinear interaction of the um, psi cubed wave function cubed. <coughs> um, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, sure. So as a saying here, in order to, so, so, so the action that we got was this one, Jack P is this one, but uh, in order to, uh, uh, to obtain the Jack P model, we would still need to, um, to put the two gauge fields to be equal, and then the two scalars to, to be equal, and the fermions to be zero, right? Uh, so that, that would be the reduction to the um, Jack P model. So really what we have here is a supersymmetric version of the Jacquin P, P model with more fields, right? Uh, no, but I meant. So you can see that I could, um, I can, um, yeah, so the action is in fact uh, not parity invariant, that's right. Um, it takes a different form. Um, yeah, I, I have not thought about this. It probably has something to do with the non-relativistic uh, uh, limit with the way it, it is taken. Yeah. <coughs> Um, this uh, action with n equal to supersymmetry has, has been used for the fraction and quantum hole effect. Um, and also uh, the wave functions for some anions in a harmonic trap have been obtained uh, using it. This is work of uh, David Tong and collaborators. And um, moreover, uh, this, um, this action that uh, we have obtained, we can show that it has an n equal to supersymmetric version of the Schrodinger algebra. With, uh, so in the Schrodinger algebra, in the lectures last week, I've, I've told you that there is a um, particle number n, but in this case, in the super Schrodinger case, the num particle number splits into separately con conserved uh, bosonic numbers and fermionic numbers. And then, of course, there are super partners and so on, as usual. So, um, so let me describe uh, particle vortex duality uh, in the path integral. <coughs> so, so now this is a separate topic, so I've, after a while I'll try to, I'll come back again to the ABJM model, but uh, for the moment, what is particle vortex duality? Particle vortex duality uh, in the usual formulation <coughs> of the uh, abelian Higgs model written in here is, um, is defined in the following way. You, def you introduce some uh, auxiliary field psi mu and then fix the absolute value of the complex scalar and, uh, and then you write down uh, an action for this um, for this angle theta with an auxiliary field psi mu. 
And after integrating the smooth part of the angle, you get uh, to this dual um, action. Um, and in the process, you see you, th there's a duality uh, relation involved, psi mu on one hand from this action becomes proportional to the derivative of theta, and on the other hand is epsilon times dA, so I substituted the angle theta for uh, gauge field A. And however, the usual way to, intr to introduce it, uh, this duality is to, to then um, introduce by hand a vortex field to describe uh, the vortices, so the dual action is kind of postulated uh, or induced, if you want, uh, to be uh, this one. But um, to me, this is not very satisfactory, so I would really like it to obtain it when thinking about path integrals to obtain it via some uh, master action for the duality in the way uh, one, one always does, um, as uh, we have seen, for instance, uh, from the, um, from the talk by Otto. So we can, um, we can introduce an auxiliary field for uh, d mu theta and, uh, um, and then impose that this relation with, uh, through the constraint that epsilon d lambda is zero imposed with an, um, um, with an um, Lagrange multiplier. And so the, max, uh, the path integral for the master action is given in here. And the, if um, we integrate over uh, lambda mu, then we get this equation of motion. And if you substitute it back in the action, we obtain uh, the dual path integral. And this is really the, the relation that I've described for you in here is really a uh, particle vortex duality because um, it relates the normal current, the current which is uh, proportional to um, psi d psi star minus uh, psi star d psi. Um, so the, the normal particle current with the vortex current through this duality relation, d mu vortex is epsilon mu nu rho, d nu j rho, with this coupling. So this relation really exchanges uh, currents with uh, vortices. Um, one, but one thing that in order to uh, really embed this into ABJM as a self-duality of the action, <laughs> uh, we need to, uh, to make this duality into a self-duality since, um, since here the, the dual action was different than the original one. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in, or, in order to do that, I used the uh, Muki uh, Papa Georgiakis Higgs mechanism in three dimensions. This is um, a version of the Higgs mechanism uh, that is specific to three dimensions. In, in, uh, in any dimension, but starting in four, one, the usual Higgs mechanism um, means that um, a massless uh, gauge field eats up a scalar and becomes massive. But, and that is still possible to do in three dimensions, but in three dimensions you have another option. You can have a Chan Simons uh, gauge field, which has no propagating degree of freedom, eating up a scalar to become um, um, Maxwell or Young Nils, which has one degree of freedom in three dimensions. So, uh, so starting with this Chan Simons action, and perturbing about the vacuum, you can uh, define a new variable in the same way as for the Higgs mechanism, eating up the, the gauge field, eating up the scalar, means that you redefine the gauge field with a component of the scalar. So the same thing is done in here. You redefine the gauge field with a component, with, with this uh, theta part. So by absorbing theta into A prime mu, you obtain an action that is now of the Maxwell type. Uh, so when we couple this um, mechanism with, um, 
uh, symmetrized version of the path integral duality, meaning so the path integral duality I present to you went from one action to some dual action. Now I kind of I could start with both kinds of actions and then basically interchange them at the end. But also coupling it together with this um, with this uh, Higgs mechanism. I mean this Muki Papa Georgiak um, uh, Higgs mechanism. Um, the effect, uh, the, the total effect is that I go from this um, path integral to this dual one, which now look the same way, it's just that, you know, the relation exchanges various fields, so here the scalar was phi, here is chi, um, and so the relation um, the relation between gauge fields, for, for instance, is written in here. So a mu plus d mu phi is uh, a, a e a prime mu, and a, e, a tilde mu plus d mu phi tilde is e a prime tilde mu. <coughs> so this allows it allows us to embed the duality into the um, ABJM model, because now both, I mean, both these actions look like something we have inside ABJM. There's some kinetic term for scalars, and then there are some chain Simons terms um, of this type, uh, one gauge field derivative, another gauge field. <coughs> so uh, I can embed uh, the duality inside ABJM in the following way. I make uh, this embedding of the fields a mu one and a mu hat one uh, and phi inside um, inside the fields of ABGM, but the fields of only uh, half of the uh, n by n matrix, <coughs> and this leads to the kinetic terms that uh, we wanted, and um, also a potential of this type. And this, uh, this reduction gives half of the needed uh, action. And the other half comes from the other half, uh, uh, the other uh, n half by n half subspace uh, by imposing a certain constraint between the fields. Uh, so here I had a, a1 and a hat1, and from the other one I'll get a2 and a hat2. So by considering this constraint that a1 plus a hat 1 is equal to a2 plus a hat 2, I get exactly um, the, um, the action that has the self-duality property. Um, we also find that there are vortex solutions. So uh, there are vortex solutions in this model. So really, uh, the, there is a particle vortex duality in the uh, ABJM model. The duality really exchanges the vortex current with a particle current. Yeah. Right. It is, in some sense, a strong weak duality. Um, <coughs> the, the, the way in which this is so is slightly, um, slightly confusing. Um, pa -pa -pa -pa. Um, let me see where. Uh, where did I write it? <laughs> well, yeah. So le let me describe it this way. So in here, mm, so the kinetic term for this uh, field theta was uh, multiplied by phi zero squared, right? So this was the absolute value of the field which um, to, in order for the duality to be cleaner, I would, I, I would have to think of it as being constant in the same way as uh, in the usual formulation. So then from this point of view, I can think of phi zero as one over the coupling, right? But in the dual action, as you see, I have one over phi zero squared for the, du for the kinetic term of the field dual to theta. So, uh, phi zero, I mean, coupling goes to one over coupling in some sense. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so then um, how do I understand this particle vortex duality from the point of view of um, the bulk uh, um, in ADS-DFT correspondence? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, the particle vortex duality is mapped to a Maxwell duality, the usual uh, duality of electric and mag magnetic fields. And the way I can think about it is the, um, the, the basic of ADS-CFT is that the partition functions are the same. And, um, <coughs> and uh, the partition function on the supergravity side would involve the kinetic term for some gauge field that is a source for, uh, for some operator in the CFT. And then uh, Maxwell duality, this relation on, on F, with, if you equate the two partition functions, corresponds to this relation on the currents, on the, uh, on the operators in the conformal field theory, which, um, um, which as, as we have defined before, this was really the particle vortex duality uh, that exchanges scalar currents with uh, vortex currents. <coughs> We have found also that there is a non-abelian version of particle vortex duality. Of course, our, our hope was really that we could, uh, we could have a transformation on the full non-abelian uh, ABGM action. Uh, so that's why we started looking for this non-abelian particle vortex duality. Um, but it, there was no such version in the, in the literature. People thought particle vortex duality is some purely abelian concept. And uh, we were able to find this, but with a caveat in the sense that um, really the non-abelian nature comes from some global symmetry. So the way we, we did that was a simple generalization to 2 plus 1 dimension of the so-called non-abelian t-duality in 1 plus 1 dimension. The non-abelian t-duality, one uh, writes the metric and the b-field um, on the world volume of, uh, which are the fields on the world volume of, uh, on the world sheet of a string. Um, so you, you write down um, the metric and the B field in this form that is written in terms of um, the one forms, invariant, left invariant forms of, uh, of a group. The, the standard example is SU2, but in principle doesn't need to be. Um, and then you write a uh, Polyakov action, and you gauge this group, G, by replacing normal derivatives with covariant derivatives. And in order not to lose anything, you impose the, that the strength is zero with a Lagrange multiplier. And so for, t, for this non-abelian t-duality, one has a master action written this way. So this, uh, this part up to here would be a gauged form of the usual string action but then uh, you introduce the constraint that f plus minus is zero. And, um, and in order to obtain a dual, dual action, uh, one has to gauge fix the symmetry by putting this group element g equal to one, in which case l becomes proportional to the gauge field, and then solve for this gauge field, write down a dual action. Um, so this was a standard procedure that was uh, well known, but uh, we simply generalized this to three, the two plus one dimensions by considering now uh, one forms uh, written in a similar way and um, invent an action that looks kind of like the one before. So in terms of uh, the real variable phi zero k and l mu i written in this way. So this is actually not the most general uh, one that looks like this, but um, it's simpler to think of uh, this case first. And, um, and then we uh, gauge uh, the group and again impose that field strength is zero for, with a Lagrange multiplier um, and obtaining this master action. And if I solve as usual, for, t for dualities, I solve for the Lagrange multiplier. Um, so if, if I solve for the Lagrange 
question. But if I first gauge fix equal one, and then I solve for the gauge field instead, um, then um, I, I solve using these equations, I obtain a dual action written in terms of the Lagrange multipliers. <coughs> And uh, effectively, this duality adds a term to the action and then replaces the L's, which were uh, proportional to, uh, roughly speaking, epsilon dv, right? So the, um, the duality is really of the particle vortex type described before, where... Um, a field with is replaced with epsilon derivative of another field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, um, well, let me skip this. But um, as an example, um, a simple example uh, of what I mean, uh, there is a model of, uh, well, um, non-abelian uh, vortices, one of the first examples of vortices that had some non-abelian structure um, was called semi-local cosmic strings. The model is a, um, um, a scalar in the fundamental of an SU2 global symmetry with a Higgs potential and an abelian gauge field. So for this, uh, for this model we consider uh, an ansatz for the scalar that looks like this. <clears throat> and then, uh, out, so I here takes the values 1, 2, 3, 4. So specifically, um, I take I equal 1, 2, 3 corresponding to an SU2, um, um, to an SU2 uh, transformation to, um, to implement the gauging in the dualization procedure. And then the, the fourth, which is a diagonal uh, U1 component, I consider to be an external gauge field. <coughs> then uh, if, I, if I consider this ansatz, the duality relates this action. So after using this ansatz, the action is written in this way, is mapped to a dual action written in this way. So again, I want to emphasize that in, in, this, ki in this case, the, the local group is still a U1, but we have a global, um, well, U2 symmetry, excuse me. In, in this case, we have not S2, but U2 symmetry that is global. And uh, uh, the duality involves this global symmetry. All right, so uh, in the last uh, part of uh, this talk, I want to give um, a small uh, application uh, of this, uh, which is in a paper with Jeff Morgan that I wrote uh, last uh, month. So um, the application is to the duality between topological superconductors and topological insulators. So a topological uh, insulator is something that is insulating in the bulk but has states on the boundary that conduct due to some topological properties. So in the ca case of a two plus one dimensional uh, insulator, um, one can derive an effective uh, action for it in the following way. So if this is a normal band insulator with M fully occupied bands, insulator in this case means uh, that um, the conductivity uh, in the X direction is uh, zero. Then the whole conductivity, which is sigma xy, um, is found to be um, to have this form. It's an integral of a momentum phase uh, space of the uh, Berry connection that is defined in this way. But for my uh, purposes, it matters only that this is uh, a topological number. It's the first general number um, of the um, Berry connection. <coughs> Then, uh, then you write the usual um, relation between the current and the electric field, which in the case of uh, uh, materials that have a whole uh, effect um, is a matrix written this way. 
and considering also the conservation equation together with um, uh, Maxwell's equations. Um, from this equation, we can actually obtain also the other, uh, the component that relates J0 with B, and everything can be put together into this uh, relativistic invariant notation with J mu being epsilon mu nu d nu a rho. And if I think of the current as the variation of an effective action with respect to the gauge field, then the effective action for this topological insulator is Chern-Simons, where C1 here came from the whole conductivity that was this uh, quantized uh, form. And then, um, so the coefficient of the Chern-Simons action as is needed is a quantized uh, number. <clears throat> so this was in the case of two plus one dimensions. Now, um, an interesting thing that I was not aware of uh, before uh, studying these things is that condensed matter theorists also think about higher dimensions, as strange as that might seem, yes. It's a rather famous paper that described the topological uh, insulators, so they started with, really they stuck, let's think of a four plus one dimensional topological insulator that had this kind of band structure and does this and this. And through a similar reasoning to the one that I described in here, they arrived at this effective action with this four plus one dimensional churn Simons. And of course, the reason is not that they think you can actually build a four plus one dimensional insulator, but that then when you reduce to three plus one dimensions, you get something new that was not uh, thought of before. So after dimensional reduction, you get the top three plus one dimensional topological insulator that has, be, uh, besides the usual uh, Maxwell term, has this theta term. The epsilon FF with uh, theta being um, a, um, a field. So, on the other hand, what's a topological superconductor? Uh, that is uh, uh, that is a material that is uh, has fully gapped quasi particles in the bulk, meaning the Cooper pairs of the superconductor. But topologically protected gapless quasi-particle states, uh, specifically fermions, on the boundary. <clears throat> and through a reasoning that is a generalization of the one written in here, um, it was found uh, that in, this, in the case of this material with two Fermi surfaces denoted by left and right, L and R, uh, the effective action for the topological superconductor is again something of this type with a theta L minus theta R, a Maxwell term, and then this is the usual um, superconducting um, um, effect in terms of, uh, I mean, we call it the Higgs effect, right? Um, and then there's also a term that um, is a Josephson co coupling that can arrive when you have two different uh, Fermi surfaces. All right, so let me, uh, now that I've described for you what these topological superconductors and insulators are, um, show you the duality uh, between them. So uh, if we consider um, constant theta L and theta R in here, these in principle could be fields, but if I consider them constant, and then I denote by m squared the sum of rho L and rho R, which were the densities of Cooper pairs after the Higgs effect, the, well, <laughs> the superconducting effect. Um, and then theta L minus theta R I call two theta tilde, then the action uh, really looks the same way as the uh, topological uh, insulator action. Not surprising that I can find now a duality relation between them. <laughs> uh, so a simple one is doing, using a master action of this type. If I replace the field A mu, um, I write F is DA, DA that I can uh, re-denote as DA tilde. If on the other hand I solve for F, then I get a dual action that looks um, similar. And the duality relation between them is the usual uh, Maxwell duality, F is epsilon F tilde. We can do uh, a similar relation uh, in two plus one dimensions. So the topological insulator action in two plus one dimensions 
I can write it this way. So there was this John Simons term, and then there's a Maxwell term. And in fact, the way to dualize this was known long ago, so this um, will, goes back to papers of uh, uh, Townsend van Nuvenhuysen and um, Desser and Jakiv. Um, and uh, so we define this field, and you write this master action in terms of it. <coughs> and if I vary, then this little f, I get the original action. If I vary with respect to the a mu, I get that a mu is little f mu over m that I can call a tilde mu. And then I get this dual action that has the, the form of a topological superconductor because I get this John Simons term and then this term with a mass that I've described for you before. This mass for the gauge field that is the coming from the Higgs effect or the superconducting effect. <coughs> And actually, this, uh, this topological superconductor action was already known as, uh, as the self-dual self action in odd dimensions. And finally, uh, I want to tell you... Um, so finally, the last application of duality is um, of the duality of the uh, 2 plus 1 dimensional Dirac fermion with the uh, Simons uh, QED. This is a duality that was conjectured by several people, and it seemed to kind of vary depending on who, uh, who, who cites it, who, who is the first. From my opinion, Son, Dantan Son was the first in a, in a paper last year, but then there are some condensed math theories that did something else to it, and people seem to cite them as more than Son, but okay. Um, and uh, so the, the duality is uh, between a Dirac fermion in a two plus one dimensional uh, space, more precisely on a brain, on a, on a surface in three plus one dimensions. So the way you think about this is as b this being the, the surface mode of the topological insulator. The surface mode is a fermion and it lives on the boundary of the material. <laughs> and, uh, and so the, the conjecture was about the fact that the dual theory um, is that um, the dual theory is um, understood as the low energy uh, theory for the half field Landau level in, um, in the presence of a magnetic field, right? So this would be the fractional quantum Hall effect with fra filling fraction one half, something that is uh, very interesting for condensed matter. So the dual theory would be, um, again, a uh, Dirac fermion, but now, there are several, uh, this is, so whereas this is normal fermion, it's coupled to electromagnetism. This, this is a quasi-particle that's a composite fermion that is neutral under electromagnetism and couples to, um, uh, couples to a field, to an emergent field in, in condensed matter that is the statistical gauge field, A mu. And then there's a John Simons coupling between electromagnetism and the statistical gauge field. So there is some details that uh, Zyberg and Witten uh, in a paper have said that actually this needs to be modified to a coupling also with the electromagnets for the correct quantization, but I'm kind of confused about that. Um, so anyway, uh, Son's conjecture, from Son's conjecture, he found that if you consider the complex conductivity, which is uh, the whole one plus I times the normal conductivity, then uh, one finds a relation between uh, the conductivity in the two systems, dual systems of this type. So two sigma is minus one over two sigma tilde. But on the other hand, there was a paper um, some, some time ago by Burgess and Dolan, I think maybe around 2000 or so, um, where from particle vortex duality, they found this relation where theta is the general anionic phase. So if you think about bosons with theta equal zero, this particle vortex duality would relate sigma tilde with minus one over sigma. But this particle vortex duality was for a scalar to another scalar. And the point we, we noted is that uh, this fermion here, so the scalar that is the Cooper pair on the, in the bulk of the insulator, is really made up of two fermions. So, 
<coughs> considering that the boson that appears in here is made out of two fermions, this relation turns to this relation with two sigma, since the conductivity, uh, in this case, the conductivity of the bosons is the conductivity of two fermions going at the same time. And moreover, if we consider the fact that, again, the, the uh, scalar is, con is constructed of two fermions, then the relation between, um, so the relation deriving from this duality, if you consider two of these things, two of these fermions, the corresponding relation would be this, with a coupling of phi to the electromagnetism and of phi tilde with the emergent gauge field with this Jan Simons factor. And this, as I already told you, this is the original formulation of particle vortex duality. So um, um, this is an argument. Then there were some other arguments in a paper in the same day by Zarg Witten and another one by uh, Tong and, well, I forgot who was the second. Um, and uh, uh, so there was some other arguments as well reinforcing this uh, idea. All right, so this was uh, everything I wanted to tell you. So let me conclude by saying that the ABGM can be reduced to a Landau-Ginsburg and to a super Jacquive P model with Schrodinger symmetry that has applications to condensed matter. Particle vortex duality can be embedded into ABGM and corresponds to the Maxwell duality in the bulk. And it can be made non-abelian and it relates uh, interesting condensed matter systems.